Okay, there we are. I hope you can hear me. I think it's just you and me, Louise. As far as I can tell, I see two people. Okay. Well, everyone is a bit uh, optimistic. <laughs> if you have any questions, you can uh, put them in the chat if you like. Then we'll just take it from there. Because it's a bit easier with the, the presentation to do it uh, on Zoom, so I can share my screen with some uh, PDFs. It's always exciting to do uh, live streams. <laughs> <coughs> One day I need to take a course in live streaming. Uh, yeah, it's, the, the first question that pops up in the chat is uh, where I can give an overview of the correspondence, its history of publication. Um, I was going to talk, talk about that later, but I can share some thoughts here already. Uh, you have to distinguish different periods. Um, during his lifetime, very little correspondence was published. There were a couple of letters that Heidegger gave permission to be used. The most famous one is the, the letter he wrote to uh, William J. Richardson which was published in his uh, famous uh, book, uh, Through Feminology to Thought. Um, there are a few others as well. Um, so, and then you have a period uh, which runs basically from uh, Heidegger's uh, death until uh, we started doing the Heidegger Correspondence Edition. And there it was basically a, a question of who wanted to do, uh, to publish some letters. Uh, it started, uh, I think the first one was the correspondence with Erhard Kestner. Another famous one is uh, the selection that Meredith was published in the Solcon Seminars. Um, and Hermann Heidegger, his son, over the years gave permission to do, for example, the Heidegger RN correspondence, but there also, there's a little story behind it. People were, uh, Hannah Arendt uh, was asked by Heidegger to destroy all his letters, which he apparently didn't, so even the, the early letters, um, although Heidegger destroyed her letters from this, uh, let's say, pre-1933 or the correspondence that ends in 1933. And uh, Herman Heidegger had no intention of publishing it, but uh, there were copies of it, of the, the letters in the 
Library of Congress where the our and the papers were kept at the time and things are still there. And people started citing from the from the letters. So then Herman Heidegger took the decision to publish the the correspondence of Heidegger and Hannah Arendt. And all the early one was uh, uh, Blochmann and Jaspers was uh, published pretty uh, also at the beginning. In recent years, uh, outside the the correspondence we are doing in our edition, uh, let's see what's the last one that was published. Uh, I think Heidegger Buchmann. And when we started doing this uh, edition, we we signed an, uh, a contract with the publisher, with Hermann Heidegger and with Jörg Heidegger. And the contents is basically that we would have uh, uh, full power to decide where and when uh, the correspondence would be published, with the exception of some volumes that had been prom promised already to other uh, publishers. Uh, the most notable example is uh, Heidegger's correspondence with uh, Kahnemer, which was supposed to have been published in the meantime already, but there were both difficulties in finding all the, the letters. I'm not sure if they found all the letters in the meantime, and there was a disagreement between Hermann Heidegger and the, the daughter of uh, Bultmann, who was uh, not satisfied with some of the the ways it had been set up, so it got stuck, basically. It was supposed to be edited by Figo for the Heidegger letters. I'm not sure that Figo will ever get back to it, but uh, we published, uh, I will show that later, in the, in the correspondence edition, uh, quite a, a few volumes in the meantime. The first one uh, was Heidegger's correspondence with Kurt Bauch. Uh, the second one was the correspondence with his uh, parents and his uh, sister, basically. Um, then we did the Heidegger Lovit correspondence, and we just uh, published the Heidegger Perkler correspondence. Holger is wor working yeah, on the on a new edition of the Heidegger Kessner correspondence. There were many mistakes in the in the edition that uh, Petzet uh, made of the correspondence. Uh, so it will be a, a corrected edition, and then uh, there are mo more letters that will be included in it for several uh, services in the meantime. And that's the, the next one that will be coming up. Uh, I will probably be doing the correspondence of Heidegger with uh, Günther Neske, his publisher, and also with uh, the Moore publishing house in, uh, in Tübingen, uh, where Heidegger published his... Uh, Scotus book, for example, and he was in correspondence with Seebeck, uh, the, the owner of the publishing house, to uh, do a translation of Bergson, but that didn't materialize. In the Heidegger Jahrbuch first volume, we, call, we, we published uh, some correspondence, uh, early letters from Heidegger and to Heidegger, so there you'll find uh, a selection of letters from uh, From uh, from Laslowski to Heidegger, which are the earliest letters we have from, from and to Heidegger. Um, we also published uh, his letter or small correspondence with Joseph Sauer. Uh, there are the first few letters of Heidegger and uh, Guardini, for example. Um, so we published there and some of these letters, at, at least. And there's also in... Uh, the correspondence with uh, Friedrich, uh, who was a Germanist at Freiburg University and a friend of Heidegger, it was published in uh, volume four of uh, the Heidegger Jahrbuch. Um, so the, we can still buy the correspondence with uh, Lewitt. The cheapest way is uh, to download the, the PDF. Uh, I think. <laughs> I've made it available available a couple of times. It's uh, you can buy it as a book. You can buy it in the English translation as well, which has been published in the meantime. So and that's about. Uh, it's not available in paperback, but the price of the 
uh, volumes are compared to what is uh, reasonable. Hello, uh, Vittoria. Um, the, then the next question is, uh, which volumes of the Jahrbuch have primary sources in them and which are collections of essays? So in, I have to think about it. In volume one, of course, there are primary uh, sources, these letters that we published. And we also published there uh, a letter that Heidegger wrote to Elfriede for her birthday. And this Greek uh, tri uh, war tritium in, uh, in Meski is also published there. And if I'm not mistaken, it also published all, sales, all Souls Move as well in the first volume of the Heidegger. Yeah, book. And it also contains the bibliography by uh, Chris Bremers. Uh, all the volumes of the book are still in print, I think. Uh, the second volume is on Aristotle, has uh, the transcript of uh, Oscar Becker of the of the early uh, Aristotle seminars. So. And they're not in the Gesamtausgabe. Mm -hmm. Volume three was on Heidegger and Nietzsche. Uh, there you have an overview of all the citations of Nietzsche in, uh, in Heidegger's work. So you can find them and compare them. Uh, then there is a uh, volume four is complete. Uh, it's completely filled with uh, primate sources. It has uh, the transcripts of the seminar in 1933-34 on uh, nature history state it has uh, a lot of documents from uh, the time of the directorship some uh, uh, no quite a quite a lot of stuff basically and uh, this correspondence with uh, Hugo Friedrich in volume five is only essays because it's a uh, basically was set up to, this way that in one volume we bring the documentation and in the second volume the essays about what's in the documentation. Uh, Heidegger Husserl, which is volume six, has the, the correspondence between Heidegger and Husserl in it, because that was only available in the uh, Husseliana edition of uh, the correspondence of Husserl. And there you can only buy the complete set of seven or eight volumes, and they cost uh, more than 2,000 euros. Uh, so let's keep this more or less. Uh, in the later uh, volumes of the Heidegger, we didn't always include uh, primary sources. Uh, just the black notebooks for obvious reasons that were just being published. So. It's hard to, to add something there. The, the, the volume that's coming out now has uh, the correspondence of Heidegger and Binswanger, which is published there for the first time. So that's uh, and also uh, the small correspondence between uh, Heidegger and uh, Frankel, which uh, most people don't realize there was this uh, relation between Heidegger and Frankel, and they were on uh, friendly terms. They met in uh, Vienna when Heidegger was doing. Uh, his lecture on the the principle of the ground, the Satz von Grund. Uh, and they met privately, uh, had dinner, and stayed in touch afterwards. There's a different question being asked by Alberto about uh, that's on the Heidegger Forum. Is finding oneself the same as choosing oneself? It's, of course, not the same. You can find yourself, but you cannot choose yourself. Because you're... You don't choose your uh, throneness. So you have to make, you could say your throne is your own, but you cannot use it, you cannot change it in that sense. You can re-appropriate it, re-think it, uh, bring it back from, from the past to the present, but it's uh, there's no moment of choosing. It's, uh, and of course, we're never completely ourselves. For Heidegger, authenticity and inauthenticity being determined by the one or the day or the das man, and determining yourself, self determination are 
extremes on the sliding scale. So you're always moving between the two. You can never get rid of one or the other. Even in deepest uh, inauthenticity, the possibility of authenticity is still there and the other way around. But who you are, I think it's simple. It's not so difficult to see the difference. Uh, you can't change uh, where you were born, how you were born, and your parents, etc. So you, you can make the best of it, hopefully. Um, that would be my little take on the, that question. Uh, I think most of the, I said already, the Abu volumes are still in print. Maybe one or two has gone out of print, but uh, I wouldn't need to check. And you can still find them uh, on the in uh, on the second hand market. Okay. Uh, another question, do you think there's a danger in essentially all of the late black metal books being edited by one person? Is it better to have a range of editors or does it not matter? Uh, it's, in this case, it's, uh, <laughs> it's a rather peculiar situation. There's an advantage to having one editor if he's a very good editor. And then, uh, of course, it, it's the same as a translator. If you have a very good translator of uh, novels, then you probably want to do that person to do the all the translations of the most important works of uh, of an author. And Trafni is not a brilliant editor, so. But of course, since he was mixed up this is, uh, in the whole discussion of Heidegger and the Black Notebooks, and basically at the origin of the, the whole problematic, it seems a bit uh, strange that uh, they let them do all the volumes in the end. And it, it, it's a typical example of the, the Heidegger family giving these mixed signals. So on the one hand, uh, then you, they try to make a distinction between uh, Peter Trafney, the interpreter of Heidegger, who is writing nonsense and Peter Trafney, the editor of the of the notebooks, who is uh, who is a decent uh, editor or a good editor, and he's, uh, uh, so if for, for in the public eye, it, it was strange. A lot of people said, well, one of them was von Herman, of course. Uh, Ulf Heidegger need to take away these uh, the editions uh, as uh, from from Trafni. and it gets even more bizarre when they are thinking about doing two or three volumes of this uh, all these notes that are still kept in the Marbach at the archive, which add up to uh, twenty twenty five thousand or something. <laughs> that he was looking at it again with Strafni. So that makes it uh, the advantage of having different editors is that it becomes a bit more free in a sense, I think. Of course, in the case of the Black, black Notebooks, it was not so difficult to edit them because they had been uh, transcribed already and, and there were type of scripts. So, and the handwriting of Heidegger is very clear. Contrary to the lecture courses, for example, it can be very difficult to uh, to see what he's uh, writing. Uh, Heidegger himself originally wanted to have uh, different editors for the different volumes, and they should be completely independent. Uh, the, the idea behind that is that you try to avoid uh, uh, turning it into a kind of school where one group of people are basically deciding what a party is published and how it's published. But uh, Elfriede, well, basically Hermann Heidegger changed that and said, well, uh, I'm going to use the people who have done it uh, before and make sure that they uh, do many. But there's a lot, <laughs> I could talk about that subject for, uh, for an hour or something. So I'm not going to do that, don't worry. Uh, what makes someone a good or bad editor when it comes to Heidegger? Uh, well, the, 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 the first uh, the first thing is that you uh, 
need to, to be able to read the handwriting pretty well. <laughs> some uh, <coughs> some of it. Uh, some uh, volumes have been uh, edited with a lot of mistakes in them. But that can happen, but then you could say the editor is not so good. Uh, I think one of the best editors is uh, Gunther Neumann, who is very precise. Uh, he's always gathering a lot of information. You can see it, for example, in the two volumes he edited of the, the lectures, volume 80.1 80 and 80.2. He's also edited uh, these big, uh, a lot of these big seminar volumes. The one on uh, Aristotle and the one on uh, Kant, for example. So uh, he's very meticulous. So for an editor, he's, I think he's probably the best editor of Heidegger. Um, I myself am not a, a great editor. I know how to do it. Uh, I've done it a couple of times. But it's... the fun part is uh, that you can read stuff that nobody has read uh, before, except Heidegger, maybe. Uh, but it can also be be a bit boring and go through all the proof editing and the proofs and things like that and correcting. So I'd say that about this topic. Uh, then there's a completely different question. The nothing is the same as no being. Uh, no, it's not the same because no being can be a being or an entity, which is not being, but it's also not nothing. So the, the nothing uh, does nichts. Uh, is not a no being. <laughs> it, uh, let's see how I can phrase it easily. I think well, you can go back to the Parmenian notion of being, where he says the being is a rounded ball, perfectly rounded, which is every everywhere exactly as dense as uh, as everywhere else. You cannot penetrate it. You cannot. Uh, there's no lack in it. So if being is this massive, uh, impenetrable oneness then it becomes impossible to understand the world we live in. Because there, uh, as, you could, as you can see uh, in Heraclitus, uh, the world we live in is one of uh, uh, blooming, perishing life, death. So that's where you need, I would say that's why you need the, the nothing, the needs in being itself, in opening up uh, space and openness is in which beings in plural, the onta, can appear out of uh, out of concealment into unconcealment and disappear from there again into a concealment. Uh, simple example is, of course, uh, a human being. You are born, you come out of concealment into this world. And when you die, you pass into concealment again. And in the meantime, you while in unconcealment. Um, So the nothing is what is negating. You need the negation. But in, in Hegel, you also need negation, but negation is being uh, sublated through the dialectical process. In Heidegger, it stays. There's no sublation of it. Uh, what a question. Do you feel that the importance of rescue to Heidegger's work has been overshadowed by the mythology of the Hütte? If so, why do you think it is? So. Um, uh, in some way, I think there's some truth in it. Uh, but our, I think the difference is probably that if when Heidegger talks about his heimat, to, uh, most of the time he refers to uh, to Meskir. Heimat in the most, I mean, in the primordial sense. The place where you come from. 
and that is uh, that's Meski. Meski is very different from uh, Todna Berg in the Black Forest. So that's where his family had been living for uh, centuries. Uh, the family on his mother's side had lived at the uh, same farmhouse from the 17th century on. Uh, you just have to imagine that uh, <laughs> the people had uh, been born and died in the same bed over one period of time. Uh, his uh, family on, on his father's side can be traced back uh, to the, the sheep farm in the, on the Dun in the Dunaby Valley, which is the part that is called the Easter. And of course, Hölderlin wrote that famous hymn, the Easter, that Heidegger also uh, discussed in his lecture course. Um, but the, uh, at the same time, you can understand Heimat as something that you. Uh, Because you need to actualize it. It's not being born in Meskir that makes Meskir your Heimat. So Heidegger in Freiburg and I think also in Tautenberg, because he spent quite a lot of time of his life there from 1920 to 1, is the is a kind of second Heimat in Freiburg than the third Heimat. Uh, he was at home both in in, in Zering in, in his big family house and he was at home in the cabin. And I think the cabin uh, has this uh, became, and became so important to a lot of people because we know that Heidegger did uh, most of his writing in the cabin. Uh, in Meskirch, he was also writing but not as much as in Tonaberg. And uh, the main reason uh, from 1938 on for Heidegger to come to Meskirch was to work together with Fritz on his manuscripts, which he had uh, been bringing to Meskirch uh, over several years, and of which uh, Fritz was making uh, typoscripts, scripts. So they would have copies at uh, different places uh, and have a better chance of them uh, getting uh, through the through the Second World War, uh, once they had installed this regular meeting, uh, they kept doing it uh, until the the late sixties. Heidegger would always go back to Meski for two three weeks and work with Fritz on his uh, on his manuscripts. Uh, there's of course the huge uh, correspondence between uh, Martin and Fritz Heidegger, which is also close to a thousand letters. And which is not complete. So you can imagine how much they wrote to each other. And of course, they had reason to write because they uh, spent very relatively little time together, which of course uh, a difference with uh, people who live in, uh, in Freiburg. Where there were a lot of the interaction would uh, just happen uh, through meeting in the, at university, meeting in the street, uh, etc. But there is something about Meski and the surroundings as well that helps understand Heidegger still, to, still think. If you've never been there, then it's uh, you miss something. Um, I have not. To admit, have you been following the recent publication of Bolin's Heidegger in Ruins? Any thoughts? Well, I've not really been following it. <laughs> I know uh, more or less what Wolin uh, thinks of Heidegger. Uh, I need to read a book uh, at some point. Uh, <laughs> sometimes I don't want to. I don't want to spend my money on uh, that kind of book. But I think uh, it's, it's, it's the same as, as Emmanuel Fai or even Farias. I think the pity is that they over, how should you call it? Uh, they go too far. They raise important problems, I think, and questions that uh, de deserve an answer and need to be taken seriously. Uh, if you want to try and prove that Heidegger was this morbid Nazi, a Nazi from basically the beginning, because it's then related back to uh, 
Abraham Santa Clara, uh, who was uh, preaching in, in Vienna when the Turks were about to conquer Vienna. And he made anti Semitic remarks. So the you can say, yeah, you have, but I think in Meskich itself, there was no Jewish population in Meskich, which is in itself interesting. So uh, they didn't play a big role, I think. And there's, of course, a can, kind of anti Semitism in, the, in Catholicism. But if you want to take it in that direction, then you uh, can basically include almost everybody. So I think there, and, uh, we know the addition that Heidegger used when he was uh, a schoolboy or a, a young student. And in that edition, there are only pretty nice texts by uh, Abraham Santa Clara that you can still read with no problems today. And there are no anti Semitic uh, passages in it. So I don't think that Heidegger was already there getting the anti Semitism from Abraham Santa Clara. Although people seem to think that likely. Mm. But uh, so on the other hand, people like von Hermann make it too easy by just saying that either it's just some uh, personal mistake behind it, it has nothing to do with the thinking, uh, uh, because these people uh, go overboard a little bit here and there. You can reject everything they say. Or I don't think it's true. But I like people uh, uh, like, uh, I think Farias and, and Fire are more interesting because they uh, did own uh, their own research as well. And brought things to light that uh, demand uh, careful interpretation and uh, study. One of the problems with Heidegger is that he often gives new meaning to everyday concepts. So if you read or he uses a word, he may mean it in a different way than you would assume if you just go with the ordinary meaning. And that leads sometimes to, I think, pretty uh, big misinterpretations. So there's another one. With the vast amount published in the GA, the events of the publication of Bytrake and the Black Notebooks, do you think there are any other works left to be published? Or is that essentially over now? Um, I think it's uh, obviously basically the Kazan Pascal is, uh, is now fully published. There's still the two volumes with letters are not there, but they're going to be based on the correspondence that has been known. Uh, so it's not going to change much, I think. Uh, but we can wait and see. Basically, I think the whole idea of doing this uh, two not the brightest idea. Because you cannot go through their own uh, editorial principle. You're not allowed to, call, to make comments on the content of the letters. You can already uh, see it in uh, the problem in GA 16 with uh, all the rectoral address or the, the time of the rectorship when uh, all these little uh, speeches and articles and letters that were published by Hermann Heidegger. They're published without any commentary. So either you suggest that it's still, uh, there's nothing problematic in, in it at all, which is a bit silly. And uh, so it would have been much better to do that outside of the Kazantas Kaga, as I've always been saying, and comment on it, and put it in the context, uh, disclose it, help people to understand what's happening in, in, in here. Um, there may be, you never know, there's still one uh, black notebook missing. We don't know if it's, it might still be uh, miss. <laughs> Uh, Vieta, he may still have it in the somewhere, but he did. Uh, he has not offered it for sale yet, so we don't know. But I don't think there will be really uh, big, big uh, shocks or incredibly important uh, writings that will see the day of light. Um, 
I think there will be more. Uh, there's more to be found in the correspondence, especially if you think the, about the people who Heidegger has been uh, corresponding with. It's it's probably more exciting. Uh, I know from Trafni that uh, among the notes in in, in Maabach that, and that will be published in the in the selection in, in, in two or three volumes, as in addition to the Gesamtausgabe, cover, that there was a, a folder on uh, Marx with some uh, longer text go for a couple of pages. Uh, and they, uh, and uh, Ulf decided that he's not going to, uh, to publish this folder, which I think would be interesting. Uh, uh, in let's see, 2046, everything uh, will be free. You can access everything. Uh, so we need to wait a little over 20 years, uh, 25 years, before uh, there's no uh, copyright anymore on Heidegger's uh, papers. Uh, are there any unanswered questions in Heidegger's life and works? Any mysteries to be uncovered as a biographer? I think there are plenty. Well, I've uncovered a couple. <laughs> there is uh, <coughs> uh, I think in, in the correspondences, there are still things to be uh, discovered. I know, of course, uh, about some of these things. The, uh, the complete uh, correspondence with Elfrida makes up, uh, I think, 1,400 letters. So there's uh, still stuff in uh, <coughs> So there it's, uh, there may be some interesting things in there. Uh, for some reason, most of the letters from 33, 34, which must have been written and exchanged, uh, are not have not been preserved. So and there, everybody can uh, draw some conclusions. Can be that they were destroyed by Heidegger or Elfrida after 1945. It can also be why that they destroyed them uh, before. Uh, because they didn't want the Gestapo, for example, to find them. So, and there's, of course, uh, I think the, the complete correspondence with uh, Boss will be interesting. There's the, uh, they can think of uh, people like René Char, Beaufre, Salan. I think there's still, uh, still more to be discovered about Heidegger and most of the time, these uh, correspondences with his lady friends are highly interesting. And they uh, sometimes also contain uh, text that Heidegger wrote especially for the, for the ladies that you cannot find anywhere else. So they will not change the, the, the way we think, we see Heidegger thinking, but it will um, still open up some uh, new uh, perspectives here and there. Uh, well, just answer first the question on the, in 2046, uh, all the stuff in Marbach will be open, so you can ask for any uh, piece of paper you like, but you still have the same problem, that if you can't write Heidegger, read Heidegger's handwriting, <coughs> you're not going to do much with it, so that's the advantage of things being published, that you can read them in a, in a readable ver uh, version, and I would say, uh, in, in, in for me, it would make much more sense to open it up now. And when there are still a couple of people who uh, can competently read Heidegger's handwriting. And like I said before, if you put all that stuff, you, you scan it and you make it available on the internet. So perfectly uh, good ways of doing something like that. Then it can... Uh, can bring something, then people can have a look at the, the different uh, notes. You can try to organize them temporarily based on the handwriting. You can try to find topics, uh, the, select them in that way, for example. So there's 
would be uh, much more uh, interesting than waiting uh, until 2046, when there will be maybe uh, nobody who can read the handwriting anymore. So, but it's, you can then get everything, and you can uh, print uh, Heidegger in any way you like. It's the same with, uh, let's say, Hegel or Schelling or Kant. If you want to do an edition of Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, there can be a copyright on the edition that somebody did, but there's no copyright on the text as such. Uh, let's go back to uh, Alberto. Do you agree that authentic existence can only be accomplished as a common destiny in the advent of the community of the people? Uh, no, I don't think that's uh, true. I think it's... Um, yeah, it's a topic that uh, demands uh, <laughs> quite some time to get to the bottom of it. I still think that uh, Heidegger's notion of, of, of German Dasein or Greek Dasein is a mistake. There's only one Dasein, which is an, uh, an existential structure that we all actualize in our uh, individuated Dasein as Dasein in this. And this structure is the same uh, in its essence uh, in Europe or in China, or in uh, at the time of the, the Greek great philosophers, or in Egypt. And that's what makes us all uh, human in that sense. So we can understand people who wrote things uh, 5,000 years ago, and we can still, uh, can still make sense to us. Um, I think authenticity, there is, a, I think the, one of the problems in being at times, of course, that Heidegger says very, very, very little about uh, being with. Uh, I think in total, it's just a couple of pages. Um, he discusses it uh, with his distinction in, uh, with these two kinds of Fürsorge, Einspringende and Verausspringende, so the jumping in and the jumping in it, let's say the taking over the existence of somebody, which happens to a lot of, in a sense, in, in, in etiquette, when you have kids, and at the beginning you, you, you tell them what they, uh, or you teach them the ways of the world and how they can be safe in, in moving around in the world and start with very simple things that the stove is hot and if you put your hand on it, you will burn yourself. Of course, children will always put their hands on the stove because it's only, it only becomes evident to you when you have made the experience. So you break your you break a leg now and then and you get hurt, but that's part of life. And in if you start thinking about some kind of authentic form of meat sign, I think Heidegger was looking for it in, in the notion of people. But then you're Basically, people is just as individuating as a manuscript. So I think if you want to, you can disclose maybe the, uh, basically it's already in your in the in the thrones in Kabbalah and facticity. The, the the country you're born in, the language you're born into. Mm. So I think there's for me it's a. Uh, it's the, the weakest part of Heidegger, this notion. Uh, and of course, if you then think of Fuchs combined shafts, uh, I think it's, there's a way of seeing it in, in, in a more or less positive uh, light. And I think, well, there's, you have these different peoples in, in, a, in a struggle with each other. And through this struggle, the best thing comes, comes about. But it's, I think, the illusion of it. It usually ends up in war and, and horror and very bad things. So I would say the, the notion of people was used quite a lot say, up to, uh, to the end of the, the Second World War. I think we should be very careful of, of the notion of people. Um, 
with the people. Of course, uh, if you look at Germany, you could say the, the, the people were the Schwab. They were the, the Saxons, the, the Franks. Or even in Germany, you have then a community of different peoples already. And they were fighting quite a lot among each other as well. So. And then you would, um, if you want to keep this notion of people, how do you define what the pe who belongs to the people? Is it, is it belonging to the people only if you are born through the soil? Is it because your parents have a certain nationality? If, if you normally it's, it works that way, if your parents are German, you will be a German. If your parents are American, you will be American. So, and what do you do with people who, who immigrate or emigrate? <laughs> I think they become part of the people as well. So then your definition of people goes out of the. Uh, well, I think there is through too high. I think if, if you think of it, uh, or better than mentioning soil, blood, race, history, language, I think there is a because through the place where you are born, you, you are part of a history, you are part of a language, but. Uh, it's still you, uh, for us to, to, to change uh, the course of history, you could say. Uh, I think race is a total nonsense. I don't think there are human races in the first place, only human beings. Um, so you, it's one of the strange things since the, the, the Nazis invented the, the theory of race, we're still struggling with it. Although there is no, there are no human races. Uh, uh, blood is the same thing. Uh, but there is, a, of course, there is a, a sense of it that you can see today as well. That people say, "Well, I come from this uh, this place. Uh, can be in France, can be in, in, in Portugal, can be in Spain, where we've grown up." And the, the landscape, I think, has an influence on people. I think it's different when you grow up in the, in the Swiss Alps, where you grow up in. Uh, in a harbor city like uh, Hamburg or uh, Marseille or Barcelona. So there is, but it's all part of your Kabofen I don't think that the problem is if you start turning it into this more general notion of blood or race. Uh, most people find it interesting to know uh, who their parents were and their great parents and you have a lot of people who get into the genealogical study of their own family tree because it's nice to see where you come from and of course now we would not call it blood but uh, genes but even there it doesn't determine you i think i'm not my gene like we don't so i would it was popular but it's, the spirit is uh, it's of course more complicated if you talk about spirit. I don't see how you can have a, a German spirit and then a French spirit. <coughs> it's also it's already very difficult to, to define what spirit then is. Is it spirit in the sense of Hegel and the use in the phenomenology of spirit? Is it spirit in the, in the more the Christian uh, tradition? So I think you. I think that's one of the the, the the blind spots in Heidegger that he didn't. For someone who was always questioning everything, he should have questioned there a little bit deeper. And even he writes basically very little about it. It pops up here and there, but there's no. I could say there's a consistent uh, story that he tells. I don't think there is. It's, of course, history is, uh, is for me, is also different because we are part of history and we are you know, determined by history and at the same time we have the possibility of changing history. 
because if this openness towards the future, so we don't have to get stuck in, in, in all these prejudices. But I think that's where I think a strong point is making clear that we often are not aware of our own prejudices and the things we read into text. Mm. That's why in the later Heidegger, most of these notions also disappear. Uh, you could say, well, that's only because the time moved on and uh, after the Second World War, nobody was using them anymore. <coughs> but there's still people nowadays. Uh, I think in America, it's one of the, now uh, a problem uh, is uh, the United States, uh, basically a, a white Christian country where only a certain amount of uh, other people are allowed and either through the skin of their color, be it uh, more dark like Mexican or uh, black, like some of the uh, people were just uh, taken out from, uh, were enslaved. And, uh, and, Brought to this uh, country without having any say in it and having no uh, <sighs> no knowledge of it at all. So <clears throat> let's see, did I make one? Uh, okay, is there one more? When you say X, Y, Z, uh, or Z, X, Y, Z is missing, as the Marbach have been completely cut off for her, that just those manuscripts piled up. There it is, remain unexamined. Uh, no, it's it's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, originally, they uh, allowed Heidegger when they bought the Kempton agreement that this whole literary estate would be going to Marbach. The first thing that Heidegger sold to Marbach was the the, the, the manuscript that was uh, used for the publication of Being in Time. Okay, so. Uh, that's still one of my uh, <laughs> unfulfilled wishes that one day we would have a critical edition of uh, Being in Time based uh, where you can find all the differences in the, over the, the editions that were being published over the years. Uh, but then they came to an agreement that they would give everything to Marbach. Heidegger used to keep them in, in earlier days. A lot of books were in these uh, carton bookcases. And Heidegger would take out uh, the books and then use the carton to, to stash his uh, manuscripts, which from the archa conservation point of view is not the best way of keeping manuscripts. Uh, so but they, uh, he was allowed to keep them as long as he were, was working uh, with them. And Hermann Heidegger and von Hermann were allowed to do the same thing because it would make it easier for them to know where things were. Uh, With a lot of these manuscripts, there are also a lot of notes packed into the same uh, carton bookcase. Um, so in Marbach, they've started, uh, of course, to uh, describe every uh, manuscript. Uh, and there are numbered pages. So if you get, a, let's say, if you, if you order a, a manuscript from a lecture course, then you, you will have uh, every page in it will be numbered. So they can check if you give every all the pages back again uh, when you return the manuscript. And that was one of the problems. Uh, you cannot simply say, well, make it accessible to everybody. You could do it with the black notebooks without any problem. They could have done it because they are they're one whole, the complete. It's just a, a notebook. Um, but with these notes, it, it would be impossible as long as they've not been uh, catalogued. So that's why I said uh, the first thing to do is to scan them all and number them. And then people could also ask for the, the original. Uh, sometimes it helps uh, if you can't read something uh, when you're working with photocopies or scans. You may be able to read it when you have the original manuscript in your hand, especially when he's writing with pencil, which is very difficult to uh, do. Uh, the, it's not that there could be anything hidden in Manawa's work. Uh, 
I'll have to read the question first. So there could be anything in the Marbach question, though. Not that much because, uh, of course, Herman Eidegger and von Herman, over the many years that they worked together, were going through all the stuff that was not uh, ordered into the uh, the structure of the Gesamtauskabe. Eidegger himself started ordering uh, stuff, and but he didn't he didn't get to finish it. So Herman Heidegger and von Herman basically decided what uh, goes on in the second force. Uh, Division of the Gesamtauskabe. And there are no huge uh, manuscripts in, in Marbach that have not been published. There's an enormous amount of uh, notes and small text that may have some uh, coherence. But one of the things that you could do is, for example, Heidegger used the paper he had used for his early, earliest lecture course in Freiburg during the First World War. Uh, in Mar work for his lecture courses there. So there are several uh, bits and pieces uh, in the manuscripts of the Mar book lecture courses. So when you turn the piece of paper, find some uh, writing from this uh, from these early lecture courses. I've been uh, with Kizil. I try to. Uh, Work on it a little bit. We didn't do a, a full systematic uh, search, but we found, I think, maybe 2021, 2025 pieces. Uh, we can find some uh, of this uh, early lecture course. But it's uh, it's also an enormous amount uh, of work. It takes a lot of time. You have to go through everything. And of course, there's no, no money to be had for it. So. You have to spend uh, a month in uh, Marbach and pay for your own expenses, then it becomes quite challenging. Uh, so, surely the question has I have expressed regret from 1933 must be answered. Look in the fast and catalog archive. Mm. Um, I think there is the, there have been uh, regret. Heidegger certainly uh, expressed the, the question of guilt is more uh, complicated. Uh, I think Heidegger never saw that he. Uh, By supporting, uh, say, the National Socialist Movement or the NSDAP, he, in a, he became killed he, uh, by supporting the, the movement. Uh, of course, he took his distance later, but this initial uh, support for the, for the movement, nazism, if you want, you cannot simply uh, leave out. So I think there, it's it's not in his character. I would say to to present excuses. You can of course say, well, if remaining silent is the most authentic form of uh, of discourse, then remaining silent about the Holocaust is the most expressive way of talking about it. There is some truth in that, I think, uh, but it doesn't solve the whole problem. Uh, I would be, uh, of course, for everybody who's interested in in, in Heidegger, it, it will remain a problem uh, to deal with the, the problematics of this uh, question. Uh, I can see that why Heidegger wouldn't uh, want to uh, present excuses just for the sake of having presented his excuse and then say, okay, I've washed my hands in innocent and now I can go on with my life. Uh, okay, I misunderstood maybe, so I'll read it again. What I mean is that people like to talk with authority about what Heidegger did and didn't say, that we have only an edited collection of his manuscripts. Well, we have... Uh, 
Oh, there are still things on it. In the, the, the materials that were used for the editions of the different volumes, there are often uh, things that have not been uh, published. Mm -hmm. the, an editor can decide that it, this is not worthy of publishing. The, there are, for example, uh, excerpts that Heidegger made from uh, from Dildai when he was working on the uh, in his early on his early Freiburg lecture courses in 1919 onwards that are not in GA60, although some others are in it. So, and then the question is, of course, why would you include the one and not the other? Uh, so that's all kind of stuff that, that would be interesting to, to, to do. But there are very few people who can do it. <laughs> um, and what Heidegger said, well, even there, it's often complicated because you have people saying the exact opposite. I know there are people who said, well, every, every time I met Heidegger and we went for a walk, we talked about philosophy and we discussed uh, philosophical problems and talked about his thinking, etc. But there are also uh, people who went on the same walks with Heidegger and they said, well, Heidegger talked about a lot of things, but never about philosophy on those walks. So it's the same with the, the German salute that in 1933, uh, Jean Kresch said that Heidegger always started his lecture courses with Mr. Heil Hitler. And other people uh, who were in the same lecture course say he didn't. So you have always to be careful with what people say, and especially if it's being written down many, many years later. And Jaspers in his autobiography talks about 1933. <clears throat> He's looking back over 30 years, so. And talking to, 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 to witnesses in a sense of Heidegger's life, you, learn, you begin to understand that there's a lot of reinterpretation going on. Uh, I think I'll take this as the one, uh, final question, then I'll move on to uh, Zoom for a little bit, uh, an overview of the correspondence. The website of the archive in Marburg says they have a collection of Heidegger's papers. It's arranged in 1969. Would this be the letter for something else? I'm not sure what they mean by it, to be honest. <laughs> I'll have to look at the website. Uh, I think uh, I'm not aware of the fact that I, uh, that Arendt was arranging Heinrich's papers in 1969. And I think she had much to do with his uh, manuscript because he was never for a longer period uh, staying with Heidegger. That you would stay at a, at a hotel in Freiburg and they would meet and uh, during the day, so I'll check it. <laughs> I can let you know. And I'm not sure. The only thing I can think of is maybe the yeah, the selection of uh, text to be published in the English translation. Because they are, of course, published in very different formats than uh, the German originals. Uh, for, uh, for taking the offsets, lectures and essays was never translated completely into English. So you find some of the text in uh, poetry, language, thought, you find some of the text in the early Greek thinking. So maybe Arendt there had a, was playing around with the, or ordering either his papers in that sense. It's the only thing I can think of at the top of my head, but I'll, uh, I'll read what they're saying about it. Okay, then anyway, uh, I'm going to close uh, this shop. <laughs> uh, I'll open up uh, Zoom again, so if you want to have uh, a little discussion about the, the correspondence, we can do it there, and I can show you uh, some PDFs. So 
maybe see you in a minute and otherwise uh, see you at some other time thanks for being present and uh, have a nice weekend see you soon <laughs>